How's everyone doing this morning? We good? I mean, come on now. I mean, we're here at 11 o'clock service. You've had time to get coffee. You should be excited to be in the house of God. Is anyone, is anyone believing to meet with God this morning? Or is, maybe it's just me. I'll preach to myself, make myself happy. That's cool. Hey, I just want to say I'm super excited uh, to be here. Um, I've actually had quite a journey over the past couple weeks that I'll get into and share with you. But first, I mean, we just need to give it up for the awesome leaders we have at the church. So let's give it up for the, the leaders God's given us. I mean, like, really excited about what they've done. They're leaving a legacy. We're, we're so thankful for that. And, and, uh, and we're just going to just have an awesome time uh, with the Lord here this morning. So uh, I need to confess something to you. But before I do that, I know a lot of you think that I'm supposed to be perfect um, because I preach from the stage. Thanks for you guys that are close to me and actually just laughed. I really appreciate that. That was awesome. Uh, you know, but there's this perception that, like, since I'm going to preach from the stage on a Sunday morning, I'm supposed to be perfect or something, and I'm far from it. Um, but uh, the one thing I want to share is a couple weeks ago, uh, I was at the point that uh, I just could not really connect with the Lord. Some of you are like, oh, my gosh, he's a Pharisee. He's on the stage, and he couldn't connect with Jesus. That's cool. If you got that religious spirit, we'll entertain that a little bit later. But what I wanted to share was that... Uh, you know, I just felt like I just couldn't draw into God's presence, and it was just, you know, stuff coming up from, like, way long ago in the past, and the Lord really led me uh, to this uh, experience that I had in Mexico on a missions trip when I was a senior in high school, where I had this, this open vision and, and saw, you know, what the Lord called me to do, and so I realized I got to do something, or I'm going to walk away from everything, and it wasn't any specific situation, it was just you know, so many years, and I mean talking about like a decade of being in ministry and not really getting alone by myself to connect with the Lord. So uh, I figured Michelle, my fiance, is going to be in Uganda for two weeks, many thousands of miles away. What better time to go to Las Vegas by myself? So what I did is, uh, is I, this is not a joke, is I actually got a round trip ticket to Las Vegas, and I stayed in Las Vegas for you know, all 30 minutes that it took me to go to In-N-Out Burger, because if you've never been to the West Coast and you've never had In-N-Out Burger, I hope they let you into heaven, because it's that good. I mean, it puts Wendy's to shame, and McDonald's shouldn't even be classified as food in the face of In-N-Out Burger, and uh, it's better than Chipotle, and for me to say that, you know it's got to be pretty good. And so, you know, I, I rent my car, I go to In-N-Out Burger, and I head to Death Valley, and uh, I'm in Death Valley for a couple days and just experiencing God like crazy and uh, writing stuff down. I've got like 30 pages of, of in my journal of what I felt like the Lord was saying and was writing this stuff down. And so uh, for those of you who don't know anything about Death Valley, it's called Death Valley because it's hot as death. And so it's 100 degrees. And just so you know, I'm in shape if round is a shape. And round shape and 100 degrees don't go together really well. And so... <laughs> Here I am, and it's my second day in Death Valley, and I'm like, I can't take this anymore. It is so hot. And so I'm driving up to the top of this mountain because I drive up to the top. It's a walk up to the top. Uh, and so I drive up to the top of this mountain to see the sunset. I'm like, Lord, you need to give me direction. I can't do this. I can't connect with you in 100-degree weather. And I felt like the Lord said, open up to Isaiah 16. So I get up to the top. I open Isaiah 16. And Isaiah 16, 1 says, I took them from the deserts to the mountain of Zion. I was like, that's really cool. So I took that as literal, and I got in my car the next morning and drove from Death Valley, California, to Utah to go to Zion National Park, and the Lord just showed up in a huge way. But the reason I say all that is sometimes you've got to get away and connect in order to get refreshed. Some of us, we just need to disconnect for a little bit and just get refreshed. Sooner or later, you know the best thing about the trip was not having cell phone reception. Because then I didn't have anybody to text, I, didn't, I couldn't get anything, and I was able to connect with the Lord. So I say all that to tell you that in day two in Death Valley, now this is before I went to Zion, so I'm in Death Valley, and I'm hiking around for like four hours. And uh, not four hours straight, because I can't physically do that. And so, you know, four hours, you know, maybe like 15 minutes, jump in a car, you know, an hour and a half there, oh, it's so hot, jump in a car. But it's four hours, and I did not eat or drink anything in 100 degree weather with the sun that is crazy intense. So I start to get a headache, my body starts to hurt, so I do what every smart human does. I go buy a Red Bull and I drink the Red Bull. It didn't work. Then 
I was like, oh, Michelle, she's an awesome fiance. So what do I do? I go and I open up my trunk because I've got my snack there, my bottle caps. Don't act like you don't like bottle caps. If you don't know what bottle caps are, they're these little circles. They're like straight sugary death, and you eat them, and they're good. And uh, I'm like, the cherry ones can fix anything because they're so delicious. But the root beer ones, they're from the pit of hell. They're disgusting. They shouldn't even be in the box. So what do I do? I pick out all the red ones. I eat them. I get on a sugar high. Didn't help. So I'm thinking, what is going to help? So I'm like, I wish I had a Twinkie. A Twinkie would help. A Twinkies help everything. They last forever. There are still Twinkies from World War I, and you can eat them, and they're good. And it's like, like that, I didn't have a Twinkie, so I don't know if it would have helped. But it didn't, my, my, my cravings and my, my issues in my body did not go away until I chugged four bottles of water, let out a beautiful belch that filled Death Valley, and about 45 minutes later, I felt great and drank another Red Bull. It was awesome. And so, you know, but what I, wanted, what I want to say is, like, your body craves certain things. And your body craves water above all else, especially in extreme conditions. It's no different than our soul craves water from the presence of God in extreme conditions. And, and, and so many people are like, yeah, but, you know, My soul's not hurt. I think it probably is. And, you know, you're like, I'm saved and I'm set free. And you get that Pentecostal voice because the Pentecostal voice makes it more holy. I've been saved for 25 years. That's great. I'm glad your spirit is saved. But the problem is we don't understand what a soul is. And see, so before we get into this, I just want to explain this, that a person, a human, is made of three parts. You've got the outer shell, which is the body. I know some of you are jealous because how beautiful my body is. (laughs) I really shouldn't say that stuff. It makes me sound pompous or something, but uh, I'm joking. Okay, I'm joking. We're in church. We can laugh in the presence of God. It's all good. And uh, so you've got your body, and on the inside of the body is the soul, and then the deepest layer is the spirit. So when someone gets saved, the spirit gets saved. The spirit is the part that God breathed into somebody. The spirit is the part that's going to live forever. But the problem is just because the spirit is saved does not mean that the body and the soul cannot be affected. See, what most people don't realize is they're like, my soul, but they have no idea what their soul is. The soul is the mind, will, and emotions of somebody. So I want you to think of an apple. I know I had to work something healthy here because Red Bull and everything, y'all are going to think that I just eat junk all the time. I'm going to Chipotle after this if anyone wants to go. And so, but what most people don't realize, if you take an apple, you've got the outside of the apple, that would be the body. That would be the body. And now if you get uh, the whole outside, the edible part uh, out of the way, you get to the core. The core represents the soul or the mind, the will, and emotions. It's the core of who someone is. But down inside of the core seeds, which is like the spirit. Because it's the part that, that when you sow the seed of the, uh, of the spirit inside of you, something beautiful is going to come out of it. You see, so it's, it's a picture. We're made of a body, a soul, and a spirit. We're not talking about the spirit. We're not talking about the body. We're talking about soul cravings or the mind, will, and emotion cravings of a human being. And so when you look at that and you understand that, you understand that, that, that your body just as it craves water, the soul craves the presence of God. The soul, the mind, will, of emotions crave the proximity, the intimacy, and the identity that the, that the presence of God brings in. And, and so what does this look like? No, what it looks like is the fact that you crave what you're made out of. Now, I want you to get this. Your body is 50 to 60% of water. It's 50, made up of 50 to 60% water. I know some of you are like, yeah, it's made of 75%. If you're still a toddler or a baby running around, then, yeah, you're made of 75% water. But then by the time bones are developed and, and so forth, the human uh, adult body is made 50 to 60% of water. That's why under extreme conditions, your body craves water because it craves what it's made out of. So the reason that our soul craves the things of God is because it craves what it's made out of. Look at Genesis 2-7. In Genesis 2-7, it, it, it paints the picture so beautifully. Uh, if we could put up Genesis 2-7, that would be awesome. It, it says there that then the Lord God formed the man from the dust 
of the ground, 50%. Then he breathed his breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. See, what happens here is your soul craves what it's made out of. It's made out of the breath and the presence of God. The breath of God comes solely out of his presence, so you're made out of the presence of the Lord. But if you don't feed your soul what it desires, it's going to get tainted. You crave what you're made out of. You, you crave the very thing that you're composed of. You, you see, you can only have the things that the presence of God brings when you fill your soul with those cravings. It brings proximity, intimacy, and identity. Now, I know what, what, what some of you are thinking. Trust me, this message, I'm preaching to myself because this is what I learned when I was in the desert. This is what I felt like the Lord was speaking. So I'm preaching it to myself. But some people in the room are like, well, you don't know my past is fine. My past is great. You know, the, the, all this stuff. But the problem is we live in the past. And if you live in the past, you can never get into the presence of God. But the, but the problem is not that God's presence doesn't want to satisfy the cravings. It's the fact that the number one enemy of allowing us to get into the presence of God is not the enemy himself. It's, it, it's, it's our own locking ourselves in our past. And so in the middle of this, some of you are like, well, my past is just fine. That's part of my testimony. My test is now a testimony. That's great for you. But then my question for you is, why are you not taking risks in business anymore because of the business failings that you've had in the past? Why are you not taking relationship risks and trusting God for something great, even though that your relationship died, maybe ended in a divorce, maybe you lost someone that you loved? But, but the problem is, if you remain locked in your past, you can never get into the things that God wants you to have. So for those of us who are saying, oh, we're fine, we're this, we're that, then how come you dwell in the mistakes you've made? How come you dwell in the past? How come you allow it to control you? I know that some of you are like, this is a cute message for a bunch of youth and young adults. Now, this is a message for adults too, because just like me, I'm sure many people are still struggling with it today. It's the past that has locked us up, and we cannot get in proximity, intimacy, or identity with Jesus. So, what most people don't realize is there's power in the now. There's power in the now. Look, look at this. In Romans 5, 10, it says, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of, the death of his son, while we were still sinners, or still enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now, look at somebody and say, so now. I mean, tell them like, like you mean it. So now, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. In the now is the reality that you have to live in order to have the cravings of your soul fulfilled. In the now, there is no power of the past. God has set it up that we could, have, that we could experience his presence in the now, but the problem is we don't want to live in the now, we want to live in the past. So there's an issue. Our souls can't be, can't, can't, uh, can't, you know, get the craving that it deserves when you live in the past. You know, right now, I feel like I could probably do an altar call and half of us would recommit our lives to Jesus. It'd be awesome and we could go head to Starbucks and uh, we could grab a Starbucks before we go see our family, which no one wants to see on Sundays, but we do it anyway. And uh, you know what I mean? And, and you could go, you could go a line, and you could be like me, and you could say, I'll have a grande ice uh, almond milk cinnamon macchiato. And some of you are like, what is that? Look, don't judge me. When I get in line at Starbucks, I became a basic white girl more than anyone else in the room. You know what I mean? I'll have two pumps of that. I'll have three pumps of that. I'll pour some almond milk in there because I can't have regular milk. I'm watching my figure. You know what I mean? Don't act like you don't do it because I know I do it. You know what I mean? That's how you know, like you can walk in. You, if you don't believe me, go sit inside Westlake Starbucks for 15 minutes. If you don't know what I mean by that. You got a bunch of adults and normal people that stand in line, all normal, all of a grande medium roast. But then 
something just breaks out in some of these people. You know what I mean? Excuse me, pardon me, I'm coming through. Basic white girl at the line. I'll have that iced skinny. Who orders a skinny? If you're in Starbucks and you order a skinny, you have a problem. You are not worried about your weight. You are in Starbucks. Just order the fattening one. The skinny one knocks 30 calories off and it tastes like crap. Why do you do the skinny? Be what you are and just order the good stuff. And, but that is where we could be and we could all go and we could all enjoy it and we could all have a pretty altar call but the problem is there is something deeper that we want to get into this morning because there are some people that are locked in your past totally locked in your past you don't know where to go you don't know what to do but you're locked in the past and so because you're locked in the past you're not allowing the presence of God to come in and satisfy the soul cravings that you have how many of you guys know who Peter is? Peter's awesome. I'm talking about Peter in the Bible now, you know. So Dawn actually tells me that I'm a lot like Peter. It's really cool when you think about it. It's like, so she tells me I could walk out of water. She tells me I could build the church. She tells me that, you know, in, in my shadow, you know, in Acts 15, people can be that's not what she means. She says I'm the Peter that one day, <laughs> doubting, living in fear, and the next day I'm walking through a wall with faith. That is a story of my life. If I can just be honest. And, and, and you can say that, you know, maybe Peter is not you. Um, but I think Peter, there's some of Peter in all of us, if we're going to be honest. One day there's doubt. One day there's fear. The next day there's faith. And the next day we're believing God for the impossible. So, so I want to just spend some time with Peter this morning because Peter is a legit dude. He's a really legit dude. I mean, you don't think Peter's legit? Did you walk on water? Hey, if some of you are like, you know, the, so many preachers, they want to just beat the tar out of Peter. Oh, well, he fell down and he, he went in the water. Well, shut up. At least he got up and walked on water. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, at least he took a step out of the boat. Who cares if he started to sink? He's the only one that, out of anyone that God ever pulled out of the water. And you know, what, you know what's pretty interesting about that? When God pulled him out of the water, obviously he had to walk back. How else is he going to get back to the boat? So God redeemed him. And, and in the middle of that, Peter... In Acts 15, you know, the people are healed in his shadow. Can you imagine lining up a bunch of people that have cancer and you just run by and they all get healed? That would be awesome. That's Peter. Can you imagine that? Like, you just walk over and you just walk in and like, I can't even get my shadow because, you know, I'm just like, do that in a little shadow. And all of a sudden, you know, he gets healed. I've never had anyone healed in my shadow because I'm not Peter. But that was the faith of this dude. Peter is legit. No one else does Jesus look at and say, I'm going to build my church on you. Peter. But as legit as Peter was, there's a, there's a section, there's a story I want to focus on. Because even though Peter had it all together, he had this moment that was not good. Jesus actually tells him, hey, hey Peter, like, there's, some, there's some stuff that's coming up, and, and just so you know, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter, you know, I'm not going to do that. I would never deny you. you. Can you imagine, like Peter? Hey, Jesus. Jesus says, hey, Peter, you're going to deny me. I'm never going to deny you. I'm Peter. Like, I don't see, like, him really, like, you know, saying, yeah, Jesus, I'm going to deny you. It's not like he got excited. Woohoo! I'm going to deny you. You know, he said, I'll never deny you. Yet he denies Jesus three times. So I, I want to look at this because this, uh, you're probably saying, how does it have anything to do with soul cravings? How does this have anything to do with the past? I'm going to show you something. There's going to be a beautiful picture here at the end. Matthew 26, 69 through 75. It says, meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in a courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, you were one of those with Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. Can you imagine that moment? Like, dude, you walked on water, you saw Jesus heal, 
You were with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the grave. And you deny this dude? Like, Peter, what are you thinking? But then later he's like, writing first and second Peter and you know in, in, in that book of Acts he's preaching and 3,000 people get saved and the only thing I want to yell at him is you're a hypocrite Peter you deny Jesus and then you write about him you deny Jesus and then you preach about him Peter's past this is not good yet it's a picture of so many of our lives and if we look at it it's a picture of how if we live in the past there's three areas that we can't have with Jesus. I want you to think about this for a minute. Uh, Peter denies Jesus. Then he hears about how Jesus was whipped. He hears about how Jesus crucified. He hears about how Jesus is dead in a grave. How do you think he's feeling in those moments? Can you imagine those three days after Jesus died? Can you imagine Peter? What do you think he was doing? How do you think he was feeling? He was locked in the past. Do you think if Peter would have stayed locked in the past that he would have done all of the crazy things that he did? No. But I want to look at these. I want, I'm going to get into these. I, I hope you got something to write something down because I really feel like if you write this down, God's going to speak to you even more later. The first one is in Matthew 26, 69. It says, Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, You were one of those with, with Jesus the Galilean. You see, the first thing that sin will do if you're living in the past and you're letting your past consume you is the first thing is it will affect your proximity to Jesus. It'll affect your proximity. Proximity, that's, that, that's how close you can get to Jesus. That's, that, that's being, that, that's the closeness. Have you ever tried to get in the presence of God and it just seems like you cannot get close no matter what, but then somewhere in the back of your mind, it's everything you have ever done in your past. Because when you're in the presence of God, there's supposed to be freedom. You're supposed to draw near. If you're living in shame, guilt, and condemnation, it is a sign that the past is the power of your life and you cannot get close or in close proximity with Jesus. The second thing, as it says in 2671, it says, Later out by the gate, another servant girl was with, uh, another servant girl noticed him and said to those around him, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. It doesn't seem like any difference from the first one. But the key here is it says, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Now that may not look like a lot on the surface, but when you're with and you're dating someone, you know what I mean? And you're lucky and, you know, you found someone great to date. And Do you take that person back to your hometown if you don't know them well? Because Nazareth, Nazareth is Jesus' hometown. Do you take, you take them to your hometown if you don't know them well? I mean, you would think you would at least spend a little bit of time and get to know them a little bit before you take them home. Can you imagine that? Like, you don't even know the person you take. Like, I would be afraid they would kill my family. You know what I mean? It's like, and here we are, and you're like, oh, I just met you. You know, it's great. And you were just on Match.com, and I'm going to take you back to meet my parents. No, you don't do that unless you are a weirdo or a loser or you're really desperate. Those are the only three ways that you do that. But in the middle of it, you only take people to your hometown when there's a close relationship. So this girl identifies Peter based off of the close relationship that she knew that he had with Jesus. So the second thing that if you live in your past or with Peter, we see is the denying Jesus affected his intimacy. Affected his intimacy. You cannot be intimate with Jesus if you are living in your past. And proximity and intimacy are two of the things that your soul craves. How do I know that this is what the girl meant? Because Peter responds in 26, 72, he says, again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath, I don't even know the man. He never, she never asked him, do you know Jesus? He said, I don't know him. Because he knew what she was saying. She was saying, do you have intimacy with Jesus? Said, I don't even know him. I don't know him. Then the third thing, is in Matthew 26, 73, it says, a little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We could tell by your Galilean accent. The third thing that we're going to look at is you have proximity, intimacy, and you have identity. Identity. How do I know it's identity? Let me ask you a question. She identified him by his Galilean accent. You don't 
talk like someone, say the same thing someone does, and act the way someone does unless you identify with somebody. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like there's people all the time. I want you to think about it. This is great with teenagers. And, and, you know, that's part of the reason I dress the way that I do. Like, who is almost 30 years old and wears Adidas superstars? This guy, because I'm trying to identify with young people. In other words, people are like, the guy's weird. All he does is spend his money on shoes. He wears keys around his neck. Look, I'm trying to identify with a crowd that I, quite frankly, identify quite well with. So I like to dress like that. I'm probably going to dress like this when I'm 60. So if you see me preaching with I'm 60, I'm going to have my joggers on. By then, hopefully, I can afford some Jordans and I'll wear some of those instead of Adidas superstars stars, and I'm going to be, I'm going to hopefully look ripped like Pastor Dennis, and I'll go from being a nice shape of round to a shape of wow. You know what I mean? And so what I'm trying to say is when you talk like someone, you act like someone, you identify with them. It's his identity. And so these are the three things that Peter, living in the past, was affecting. It's affecting his proximity, it's affecting his intimacy, and it's affecting his identity with Jesus. Those are the three things that our soul craves. Those are the three things that come out of the presence of God. Because when you're close to Jesus, you're around the miraculous, and when you're intimate with Jesus, you can hear the sound of the miraculous, and when you identify with Jesus, you become the miraculous. You see what I'm saying? And so it's like in the middle of that, the presence of God is, is breathing and it's moving, and all three of those things are working together. But the number one enemy of keeping us from that is living in the past. Can you imagine Peter all this time walking around? Do you think Peter could get close to Jesus? Physically, he could not. But do you, think that, do you think that he could spiritually be close to Jesus or feel intimate or identify with him? No. It's a picture of our lives. I'm here to tell you this morning that I believe that you came into this place because God wants to set you free from the past so that you could have proximity, intimacy, and identity with Christ. You see, we all try to do things and make it about ourselves. Don't, don't act like you never made it about yourself. You know, you can't feel close to Jesus, so you make it about you. And you, you can't get intimate with Jesus, so you make it about you. And you can't identify with Jesus, so you make it about you. Don't act like we're not a bunch of people that try to make it about us. We try to make it about us, but Jesus said, let it be about him. And in the middle of that, we see something. And, and in the middle of that, we see that, that just like I can imagine Peter. Can you imagine him? Can you imagine Peter? He's, you know, it's, Jesus is, is gone for, for three days. And, and, and then here's Jesus. And, and, and Jesus, uh, or I'm sorry, here's Peter. And, and during that time, you could just imagine, you know, he's throwing the things that he likes to do. We'll let that be the blue. And he's throwing those things, you know, I just painted the microphone. That's amazing. Good thing it's water soluble and it will come out. And so you could just imagine that, that, that Jesus, you know, is, is sitting there and he can't get close with Jesus, but he's trying to do all of the things to bring him close. So he, he, he grabs the things that he likes. So it's a picture of us. You know, I don't know what it is you like to do. Maybe you like to go to the fancy restaurants. Maybe you like to do, do the golf game. If you're anything like me, you try and try and try and try. But no matter what you do, you will always suck at golf. You are not born Tiger Woods. You'll never be Tiger Woods. In fact, you got a hip flexor and you still think you can golf, but you do it anyway because it gets you away from your wife and your family. I understand I'm only engaged. Trust me, I understand it. And so we throw those things at the proximity, I, uh, intimacy, and identity issues where we try to make it look a little bit better to make ourselves feel better about it. Don't act like that's not us. Don't act like that's not us. Sorry, Mike, we're probably going to have to buy a new cap because it's blue now. And uh, the other thing that we've got going on is we try to throw things of this world at it. Oh, my gosh, this is the big one. You know, you know, we're not being able to connect, and, and, then, and then what we got going on is, is you know, we try to throw, you know, our, our ways of, of making money at it, because somehow we think that, that, that money is going to fix things. Somehow we think that, that, that money is going to change who we are. Somehow we think that money is going to change our, our situation. It's going to change our intimacy. Some of us think that we can buy into the intimacy of God. You can't buy into anything. God doesn't need your money. He chooses to let us sow in so that he can be a blessing to us, but he does not need it. It. And so we see all these things. We're like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to identify with my job, with, with what I got going on. I'm going to identify with it. So we identify with the things that are prospering us. We identify with the awards and the accolades. 
and would try to create this picture to make us feel better about our situation, which is really, at the end of the day, a, a, a soul issue that we're not getting into the presence of God because of the past. And then, and then some of you are like, you know what? This is, this is kind of right on, but he, he didn't talk about the one that I'm dealing with, so this must not be for me. The number one thing that people will throw when they're living in the past at the proximity, intimacy, and identity issues is relationships. You, you, you know, and, and some of you are like, you know what? I, I can't feel like I'm close to Jesus anyway, so, so why, go to, why go to church in the morning? You know what? It might be better to, like, fill up my Sunday so my kids are happy. And I'll just take them to a bunch of sports stuff. And so forget about the presence of God. We'll just do that. And, and some of us are like, you know what? I can't find intimacy with Jesus, so, so you know, I'm just going to hook up with him and, and, and you, know, you know, look at that. And, and, and you know, I, I'm just going to go, you know, find the, the next best thing. And, and, and so, so what do we do? We find intimacy in, in, in relationships. We find rela- intimacy seeing boyfriends or girlfriends or even if even if we're married we, we put our spouse on a pedestal and we get mad when they don't satisfy the intimacy that we're craving but we still throw the relationships at it and then the identity we want to be identified uh, you know, based on who we're around. So we get around a crowd that we like or, or, or we get around a crowd that we think is successful or, or, or we identify with this group or that group or we try to be somebody that we're not and we throw all of these things at these issues to try to mimic and to try to mask the real problem which is we're living in our past. So what do you do in the middle of that? Yes, I just checked my Adidas to see if I dropped water on them or paint on them. You can judge me, it's all good. This is a picture of us. But this is a picture of us living for ourselves. You've made it about you instead of making it about Jesus. So what does Peter do? Because obviously Peter changes, and and, and Peter has a a transformation, and, and Peter just you know, preaches and 3,000 people get saved and 3,000 people are baptized in one day. That'd be a pretty cool sight to see. And, and Peter writes books in the New Testament. Peter's the one that, 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 he, that he's the one building the church. What happens? He got over the past. Some of you are like, yeah, well, he never asked Jesus into his life. Can I ask you something? After Jesus was resurrected, Peter was walking with Jesus. He was talking with Jesus. He was experiencing Jesus, but he still had proximity, intimacy, and identity issues with Jesus. You can be in the house of God every single Sunday. You, 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 can, you can pray your heart's content now. You can be at every prayer meeting. You can be at every vision meeting. You can, you, you can, you can give an offering every single week, and you can just keep checking off the things off your spiritual checklist that really is supposed to meant to, 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 to give you life, but because of you living in the past, all it does is it, is it brings you down. But you can continue to do the checklist, or you can allow Jesus to move in and do what only he can. See, all across the room, and this is me, and I had to get this a couple weeks ago, but all across the room, there are people living in a form and a shadow of Christianity that is saying that you identify, that you have an intimate relationship, and you get close, yet deep down inside, you can't even approach the presence of God because of the past. And that's where Peter's at. That's where Peter's at. So, so of course, Jesus is going to step in and do something only he can I want you to look at the setting of this before we see what Jesus actually does. It's in John 21, 14. This is is the setting here. It says, this was the third time Jesus had appeared to the disciples since he had been raised from the dead. This is the third time that Peter has seen Jesus since Jesus rose from the dead. And so many people are like, oh, that's really cute. That's really wonderful. But God doesn't put dates and times and numbers on accident. The third time is the third time because there's a reason because of what the number three represents. The number three represents completeness or fullness. 
It's, it's, it's a number of completeness. It's a number of heavenly completeness. You, you don't believe me? It, it's, it's a number of the complete plan and power of God. You don't believe me? I'll, show you, I'll tell you some of the ways the three was used in the Bible. Before the flood, there are three righteous patriarchs, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. After the flood, there's three righteous fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are three periods of God's annual feasts and festivals on earth. There's the spring festivals, which is summer and the days of unleavened bread. There's the summer festivals, which is Pentecost. I think it's kind of cool that when it gets hot outside, the Holy Ghost wants to come down, and the fall festivals, which are the Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles. Then there are 27 books in the New Testament, which is 3 times 3 times 3, or completeness to the third power. Then on top of that, God is described in three different ways in Revelation 1-4. He's the one that which is, the which was, and the one that which is to come. Then Jesus prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane because he had to have the completeness and fullness of what God was doing inside of him in order to do the mission that he was uh, pointed to carry out. Then he was placed under cross at the third hour and died at the ninth hour, which is three times three or 3 p.m. Then, you know, for three hours, darkness hovered over the earth as Jesus was on the cross from the sixth hour, which is three times two, to the ninth hour, which is three times three. That Christ was dead three full days and three full nights. So at the end of the day, he rose again on the third day. And, it, and the Bible really is saying that three is the number of the resurrection. So Peter, I don't know what you got going on in your past. Church, I don't know what you got going on into your past, but somewhere along the line, the resurrected Jesus is about to walk through. Peter, I don't know if you know what's coming, Peter, but just because you got proximity issues now doesn't mean you're going to have them then. Just because you got intimacy issues now doesn't mean you're going to have them then. Just because you can't identify now, Peter, do you know that the resurrected Jesus came in this place? And here Jesus comes and sit down. I'm not done yet. Oh, man, I'm, I'm, feeling the, I'm feeling the anointing, and I don't know what's going to happen. It's about to get wild. Because when there is resurrection power, the past is nullified. Look at this. It's not just good enough that Jesus shows up on the third day. He's got to do something pretty spectacular in the middle of it. It says, after breakfast, I love, I love that Jesus cooked them breakfast. That is awesome. Hopefully at Elevate, they don't want me to cook breakfast because I can't even make burnt toast and jelly properly. That's why I just gotta stroll right through. Basic white chick mode in Starbucks. Give me that coffee and that sandwich. Spinach feta wrap that tastes like junk, but I'm gonna eat it anyway. And it says after breakfast, only 270 calories, sometimes you gotta make a sacrifice. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Then in verse 16 of John 21, it says, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. To take care of my sheep, Jesus said. And then in verse 17, it says, a third time, he asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. Then Jesus asked him the question a third time, and he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. When Jesus comes to set him free, he asked him three questions. So why did he ask him three questions? Because Peter denied him three times. You notice that Jesus never says, hey, Peter, you denied me, so you got to love me now, baby. He never says that. Jesus will never bring up your past when he's coming to set you free. And this is what happens. What ends up happening is we see that the first time, the first time Jesus says, hey, Peter, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, yes, Jesus, I love you. He doesn't say they get close to me. He doesn't say that. Why did you deny me? He focuses on his future. And he says, then feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. That's the second time he says, Peter, do you love me? Even though Peter denied Jesus, remember it said that, that he must have denied him because it was Jesus of Nazareth, the intimacy issues. And Peter, uh, Jesus doesn't bring it up. He just says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, I love you. And then the third time, remember he denied him. Oh, I don't have a Galilean accent. I'm nothing like him. I don't identify with him. I don't talk, walk, move like him. I don't identify with him. Jesus doesn't say, do you identify with me? He says, do you 
love me. And the third time Jesus started, Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And he says, then feed my sheep. What I came here to tell you this morning is you may be having proximity, intimacy, and identity issues, but there is a resurrected king that is coming to room. There is a resurrected king that is breathing on this place. There is a resurrected king that says the proximity issues don't matter, the identity issues don't matter, the intimacy issues don't matter. There are some people in the room that need to know that Jesus came into this place this morning to meet with you and to meet with you alone. The past is no more because when the resurrected king is in the room, the past is nullified. When a resurrected king is in the room, somebody's got to get excited. When a resurrected king is in the room, you can't help but know about his awe and his wonder and his glory because I'm here to tell you this morning, the name of Jesus reigns in this place. The resurrected king is here and somebody needs to get excited for what Jesus is going to do. Three times and it's the same question he's asking this morning. Do you love me? In the room this morning, there may be, may be some people and, oh, there's a moment that's brewing, but first we got to take care of something else. In the room, there's some people that may have never asked Jesus into your life. You can't have proximity and intimacy and identity with Jesus because you never asked him into your life. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand boldly where you're at. I'm going to pray for you. If that's you. See your hand, see your hand, see your hand. Just repeat this prayer after me and we're all gonna pray this together. Just say, Jesus, I know I've messed up and I've fallen from you, but I believe you died on the cross for me. You forgave me of my sin. You made me right in the eyes of God. And Jesus, I also believe that you rose again from the grave, defeating death and giving me eternal life. So Jesus, be the Lord of my life and the Savior of my soul. In your name I pray. Amen, amen. Let's give these guys a round of applause. No, I mean like there's angels in heaven that are pumping their wings and they're throwing a party right now, baby. If you prayed that prayer, the reason I'm so excited is because the Bible says that you have gone from death to life, that you've been made alive in Christ. And so all we want to do is, is there's a connect card in the seat in front of you. Just grab that. Fill that out at the bottom. There's a spot that says, I decided to give my life to Jesus uh, today. Just go ahead and check that off. And out at the VIP table, we have a, uh, uh, a Bible for you if you need one. And it will help you get connected in other ways to the church. But I just need to talk to the church for a minute. Is that okay? We got some people that are stuck in the past. We got some people that are stuck that you can't get close, you can't get intimate, and you can't identify. But I'm here to tell you this morning that the same resurrected Lord that stepped into the room and the same resurrected Lord that set Peter free is the same resurrected Lord that's here now. There's some people in the room that Jesus is asking you the same question. Do you love me? And you may just need to tell them this morning, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You can say it right now. Who cares what the person next to you think? I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus, because in those words, I love you, Jesus, it's freedom. It's the past that's nullified. When you cry it out, I love you, Jesus, you have your proximity restored, your intimacy restored, and your identity restored. So someone needs to get excited in this place, and we're going to go into a song of worship because it's about him, and it's about him alone. Jesus, it's about you.
lift the hand of God. Say, yeah. Lift it up to him. Begin to shout how good he is. Tell him how much you want to be in his presence. Come on, it's all right, church. Take a moment. our soul craving sermon series make sure you're here next week we're going to have just an incredible word for you i'm going to be bringing some that god's really just placed on my heart next week and so uh, also don't forget 401 if you haven't taken 401 yet that's really one of the most important classes you can take if you're at the church it's going to be in the fireside room right over here at 6 p.m we're going to have child care we're going to have food for you and uh, after you do that, you can get a, a part of different serving teams here at the church, what we call the Dream Team. And then this Wednesday, last thing I got to say is this Wednesday, make sure you're here. We're calling all leaders, anyone that wants to just see revival, anyone that is hungry for God. I hope that you're hungry after these last four weeks of this sermon series. I talk about soul cravings. You know, if there's anything that I've gotten over this whole last month, it's, you know, I need to get hungrier. I need to have a greater hunger for God if I'm going to experience more from God. You know, we're just going to come together this Wednesday. We're just believing for the biggest prayer meeting we ever had, and we're just going to seek God. And so make sure this Wednesday, 7 o'clock, it's only till 8 o'clock, so it's not that long. Hopefully we'll see you there. Love you all, and have a great week.